Problem A. In this problem, first of all, I can say that if the values of n and m are both equal to 1, then there's definitely nothing we can do. That only cell should be 1. But if at least one of them is greater than 1, it means that n times m is greater than 1. Or in other words, we have more than one number. If that happens, it's just enough to shift all the numbers. So wherever 1 is, we can put 2 there. Wherever 2 is, we can put 3 there and so on. Wherever nm minus 1 is, we can put nm there. And wherever nm is, we can put 1 there instead. So it's like we are shifting, we are rotating everything. And for each value a of i and j, we just add them by 1. Only if they were nm, we will turn them into 1. If you want to see a code, a good code that shows this is this code from Eknervala. It just says that for each one of them, if n and m were both equal to 1, the answer is minus 1. Otherwise, if a was equal to n times m, a is going to be equal to 1. Otherwise, a plus plus and c out a. And that's all about problem a. In problem b, we want to turn s into t. If we consider the first place that s is 1 in there and the first place that t is 1 in there. First of all, I can say that if the first place that t is 1 in there comes sooner than the first place that s is 1, then the answer is definitely no. It is impossible. Because in here we have all zeros and when we have a prefix of zeros, there's no way that we can turn one of them into one. Therefore, they always remain zero. You can easily see that with our operations, there's no way that one of them turns one. So the answer is definitely no this way. However, if the first one in S always comes either at the same place or sooner than where the first one of T comes, the answer is always yes. Because after the first one, we can change every bit we want. We know that in here there are all zeros, assume that there are i bits here till the first one that we have. If we want to change any bits, we know that we only want to change the bits here. So change the bits at place i or later. Each bit that we want to change is enough to consider the interval that starts before this character and ends at this character. If we only consider this interval, they will be XORed with the first i bits. And only this one will be changed. So after the first one, we can change s as we want and there's no problem in there. Therefore, we can get everything we want. So we can turn s into t. Therefore, the answer is definitely yes in this way. So it's just enough to consider the first place in s that is 1 and the first place in t that is 1. If we take a look at the code, here is a good code that has implemented this idea. It says that it's just enough to have a 4 and for each character, if s of i, we have started from the beginning and we're moving forward. When we see a character, if it was 0 in s and 1 in t, the answer is definitely no. Otherwise, because we can continue this for as you can see till we get to the first one in s and we don't continue after that. Therefore, we know that in this case, we are sure that the first one in t comes faster than the first one in s. Therefore, the answer is no this way because the first one in t comes before the first one in s. But in the other case, if first we get a 1 in s, the answer remains yes. And at the end we just see out s. So it was only enough to see that which one of these two strings have the first one. Problem C, Hangul games. If we consider for each i, which j's are there such that if we start from i and go to j, the final answer is not going to be 0. Well, the point is always we have some value of x and wherever our sum reaches x, we set g to 0 again, wherever g becomes greater than or equal to x. If g is not greater than or equal to x, it remains whatever it is. So if for each i, if I start from i 
I can find out the first j such that the sum of this interval from i to j is greater than or equal to x. I can simply say that all the intervals that start from i and end in these places are going to be good. But the interval that ends in j is going to be bad because its sum is greater than or equal to x, so it turns to 0. But afterwards, everything that starts from i is equivalent to everything that starts from j. Because when I get to j, when I start from i and get to j, my g gets to 0 again. Therefore, it's like I have started all over again from j. So the rest of them is going to be exactly the answer that j has. Therefore, if I define some dp, I can say that if I find the first j, such that sum of i to j is greater than or equal to x, dp of i is going to dp of j plus these places that you can end are intervals starting from i. And the number of them is going to be j minus i. So the only question is to how to find the first j. Well, that is also simple. We can just use prefix sums and find out what is the sums of prefixes. What are the sums starting from the first place to every place? And then if we have all the prefix sums, it's just a simple binaries because we know that what is the sum of this prefix before i if this is for example s we need to find the first j such that prefix till j its sum is gonna be at least s plus x we're gonna need to find the first such place with the binary search we can simply find that out in o of log n Therefore, we can find j in O of log n and our dp of i can be simply updated by dp of j in O of 1. Therefore, our total time complexity also is going to be O of n log n. A good code that shows this solution is this one from LAYN. And in here you can see that he or she has calculated all the prefix sums and then for each of the values of i, has found the upper bound of this value p of i minus 1 plus m, m is the value of x that we And then he simply has said that f of i is equal to j minus i plus f of j plus 1 and at the end s plus equal to f i. So this way you can simply calculate s by using prefix sums and binary search the answer can be easily calculated and that's going to be all about this problem. Problem d Problem D. Well, this one is indeed a very beautiful problem. The key observation in this problem is that the order of choosing edges does not matter. What do I mean by that? Well, the point is that if you have a set of edges at the end for your tree, it doesn't matter in which order you have added them. If you just fix a tree, you say that, okay, I need this tree, I want to construct this tree. It doesn't matter in which operation, which of these edges you have added. I mean that if you have fixed a tree, it doesn't matter that at which step, which one of these edges are added to your tree. You just have a set of edges and you know that they should be added. They can be added in any order. So our main objective is to first find out the set of the edges that we want. And then we will figure out in which order we will add them. So the point is that in operation number x, we need to add an edge between two vertices such that a of u minus a of v is going to be divisible by x. We know that once our x is 1, once it is 2, once it is 3, and so on, it's going to be n minus 1 at the end. So we have each one of these abilities. You can write 1 on the edge that you're going to add in the first place, 2 to the edge that you're going to add in the second place, 3 to the edge that you're going to add in the third place, and so on. The point is that initially we have n vertices. We have n vertices. By pigeonhole principle, 
two of them are the same modulo n minus one. So by pre-general principle, you can choose two of them such that their absolute difference is divisible by n minus one. So you can choose these two and write n minus one on them. And then from now on, you will ignore one of them and you will keep the other one. The next time, let's decide that which edge I'm gonna choose and put the label of n minus two on it. The point is that next time, from these n vertices, n minus one of them are left. Because remember, we have removed one of them in the previous operation. So again, it's like we have n minus one, and this time the numbers we choose should be same modulo n minus three. So we can keep doing this. Each time it's like we have x plus one vertices, and we should choose two of them such that they are the same modulo x. And by p general principle, we can say that they always exist. So we can always do that as we want. So we can choose all these edges, but at the end we will print them in reverse order. I mean, the edge with label one is the last one that we have figured out, but that's the one that we'll, we will add at the first place. So we start from the end, choose all these edges, and then at the end, in reverse order, we will print the prints them. The code that has implemented it in a very good way is this one by Thomas. That you can simply see that he has a four. He started from n minus one. First, he wants to choose the edge with label n minus one, and he will go in the reverse direction. Each time, he will have a four on all the remaining vertices, and if the value of fi was not zero. fi just means that if that vertex is dead now or it isn't dead yet. I mean that we, as we said in iPad, we said that each time we will kill one of the vertices. So each time one of the vertices will get removed. So the value of fi just shows that if this one is removed or if it is not removed yet. And if it is not removed, if f of i was still true, if it was still one, we see that what is ai modulo x and then we say that if it was marked it means that there was another value that was exactly the same modulo x so we can say we can add this edge between these two between the last one that had this value modulo x and this one l of x is the previous one r of x is this one and we set f of i equal to zero because now we can kill vertex i. As I said, when we add an edge between two vertices, we kill one of them. And this is if mark of t was already something, if it shows that already some vertex has this value modulo x. If it wasn't, we just said that mark of t is equal to i. And the point is that because the number of possible answers is less than the number of vertices that we have, two of them are going to have the same answer, the same value modulo x. So we can always choose an edge with this label x. This way we will find out all the edges and at the end, in the increasing order from one to n minus one this time, we will print all these edges. So this way very beautifully this problem can be solved. Problem E wooden game. First of all, I say that in this problem, if I had only one connected tree, only one tree, my forest was consist of a single tree, then the best answer that I could get was the size of this tree. I mean, it's always optimal to choose all of it at the same time, because I know that as soon as I have used several steps, as soon as in my steps, I have chosen A1, A2, 2, AK. These are the sizes that I've removed. I know that my answer at the end is gonna be A1 or A2 or A3, 2, AK. And we know that this value is less than or equal to A1 plus A2 plus A3 and so on to AK, which is equal to N, the number of vertices. So the best we can get by a1 or a2 to ak is going to be n. So if it was only one tree, the answer was n. And it was always optimal to choose all the three in one place. 
Now assume that we have several trees. I want to say that it's always possible that if I have one component with size x, any y from 1 to x is possible for me to, to choose a chunk of that size. Because I can do this operation x minus y times. Each time choose a leaf and remove that. And then at the end I'm left with a connected component of size y and I can then choose that connected component. So the point is that I can start from a connected component of size x and I can remove leaves one by one. Yes, and all of one will be added to my final answer. But that doesn't matter, that wouldn't do any harm. That just makes my answer better at the end. Having all with one does not make my answer worse. So I just have an additional all with one which does not do any harm. But at the end I'm gonna have the y I want. So the point is that from each connected component, if the size of that connected component is x, you always can choose any number from 1 to x from that connected component and have that to in your OR. So now let's consider the sizes of these components in base 2. You're gonna have several bits. In base 2, you're gonna have several bits. And each bit is going to be 1 in some of them and 0 in some other ones. Well, first, let's consider all these bits that at, in at least one of the numbers they are 1. Let's consider all of them, all the bits that in at least one of these numbers they are 1. We know that some of them are 1 in only one of the numbers, one of the sizes, but some of the bits are one in more than one of the numbers. So we know that for some of them they are only one in one of the numbers, for example like this, bit, but some of them are one in many. The point is that if I have some bits that I know that it is one in many places, I know that from the first one I can choose one and zero, zero, zero. The rest of it can be zero and the previous one are as they are. For example, if there are someone here and someone here, they are as they are already. But anyway, I can have a number that this bit is 1 and these bits are 0. And for another one of them, I can just change these bits to 0 and change all these bits to 1. This way, I'm making this number smaller and I'm keeping all the previous digits as they are already. So I know that so if I know that several of these are 1, the point is that in my OR, I can make sure that from that place to the end, I can have everything to be 1. Because for one of them, I can keep that bit 1 and have the ones after it 0, have the bits after it 0. And in the other one, I can make that bit 0 and make all the bits afterwards 1. Therefore, when I take OR of these two numbers, all of these digits at the end are going to be 1 and so if I have a bit that it is 1 in more than one number then we can make that bit to the end 1 in our final answer but what about before that? what about these places? well the point is that in these places for each of the bits I have only one number that is 1 there. so I can say that greedily it always makes sense if I keep them to be 1 because if I make them 0 if I mess up with them in the future, maybe I'm gonna have better bits, but I'm missing these bits. I'm gonna consider the first bit that you're gonna miss. Definitely there you're making your number smaller. So you cannot mess up with these numbers. They are only one in one of the numbers, and if you mess up with that, this one becomes zero, and maybe the next bits become better, but that's not helpful. So if you start from the most significant bit, that one should be 1 because if you mess up, that one becomes 0 and even if the next one will be 1, that's not going to make the number larger. This need. So that's going to be all about problem E. Problem F start you. Well, let's consider all the edges that have 1 on them. These are the critical edges. You have to keep them. You can do nothing with them. They should be in your path. So you, should, you cannot remove them from your path. But the point is that there are so many other edges as well that they are not critical. I show them with blue color. 
So these ones are not that important. If I want, I can remove. And I know that at the end, I want to have tool because you vertex and then you go out of that vertex, you exit that vertex, you enter and then again, maybe in future you enter again, but when you enter, you definitely will exit as well at some point. So the degree of each vertex should be even because when you enter, then you have to exit as well. There's only one thing about the first vertex, the source where you started your journey. And the point is, and the point is that because you also need to get back to that vertex as well, it is correct that at the end you can come there and you do not need to go out of there. But the point is that you started from there. So initially you were there and you have to go out and then come back again, then go out, then come back again, then go out, then come back again. So you can simply see that for that vertex as well, the degree should be even. So at the end, I want to make sure that by removing some of these edges, I can make sure that all the degrees are going to be even. Now let's ignore these critical edges because we cannot remove them. They should be there. If we remove these critical edges, you're going to have several connected components that they are not connected by non-critical edges. So if you remove all these critical edges, do not consider them, just ignore them for a second, you're going to have several connected components. And the point is that if in any of these connected components, the sum of degrees is odd, it always remains odd because they are not connected to outside by non-critical edges. So you cannot remove anything that subtracts exactly the degree of two of the vertices. So the parity will not change. The parity of the degrees will remain the same always. And initially you have some degrees for the vertices. You have some degree for each vertex and those red edges, those critical edges are counted as well in your degree. So each one of the vertices have some degree. If the sum of these degrees was odd, it always remains. So it's not possible that all of them will be even. You just need to find out if in these connected components, in all of them, the sum of the degrees is going to be even or not. If in one of them it is not, then there's nothing that we can do because it always remains odd. Whatever edge that we remove, because it should be a non-critical edge, it should be one of these blue edges, reduces this sum by two. So the parity will not change. But now let's assume that it is even for all the connected components. If it is even, you can just simply run a DFS on the vertices, take the spanning tree of these connected components, and whenever you reach a vertex such that its degree was odd, then you have to remove one of its edges. You can simply remove their edge to one of their ancestors, either this edge to its parents or one of its ancestors. You can freely remove one of these. And if you make all of these vertices have even degrees, then the roots will have even degree as well because we know that the sum of the degrees is even. So if all these turn into even, the roots will automatically turn into even as well. And you do not need to worry about them. And for all the other vertices, it's just enough to say that if it is not okay, just remove one of its edges to one of its ancestors. So we run a DFS, we go to the leaves and we start from the leaves. We go from bottom to top. And each time, if a vertex was not fixed, it's just enough to remove one of the edges to one of the ancestors and it will get fixed. It will become even. And this way you can easily find out that which edges you need to remove. And at the end, you're going to have the path you want, the Eulerian tour that you want. So just remove these edges and in each connected component, check if the sum of the degrees is even. If it was not, the answer is definitely not possible. If it was, it's just easy to find out which edges you need to remove by running a DFS. Problem G. This one is indeed one of the very beautiful problems as well. In this problem, the solution is to use. In this problem, using DP is gonna again help us to solve a problem. Well, we know that we have several digits. 
Each one of them have exactly k digits. And we know that they are n numbers. And they are going to be equal to some number with, again, k digits. What we can do in here is to start from the least significant bits and go toward the most significant bits. And let's consider that we have already fixed the last i characters. So we have fixed all this i characters. And dp of i and j says that as soon as all of these are fixed, all of these last i characters are fixed, and now the value they will contribute to the next bit, we know that the sum of these last i digits of their sum is going to be equal to s, the last i digits of s, but they have some left over as well. They, they have something that will be left for the rest of the digits. So this j means that what is the left over? Because we know that the sum of the last i bits is not going to be only about the last i digits or i bits of s. It's going to have some leftover for the next bits as well. Therefore, we can just keep that what is this leftover. And we'll try to update this dp in order to find out if we can make these values equal to s or not. And we use that in order to find out if we can make the sum of these values x or some x equal to s or not. Well, the important point is that from dp of i and j, I can only go to dp of i plus 1 and two possible values for the second dimension. These two possible values are j plus the number of these numbers such that this specific bit in them is 1. For example, assume that there are x of these numbers such that this, this bit is 1 in them. So either we go to j plus x because x of these have this bit equal to 1 divided by 2. Why divided by 2? Because whatever this leftover is, when we are removing one more digit from the end, the significance of the bits will be doubled. So whatever our sum is, when we are going to a more significant bit, because now the significance of them is doubled, it's like we can just divide our number by 2 to see that how it will contribute to the next bit. What is the value that it will add to the next bit? And when we want to see that how much is contributed to bits i plus 2 after we fix the first i plus 1 bits, we can just add all these ones in this place and also divide this by 2 because we know that whatever this value of j plus x is the remainder of it by 2 will be there for this specific bit but the floor of its division will be passed to the next bit so if I need to be more precise, I should also put a floor sign in here because the remainder is going to be here and its value divided by 2 will be passed to the next bit. So I will go to this one of these two places. And here the beautiful fact comes. About i, we know that i is up to k. But what is the limit about j? The point is that we can easily prove that j is up to n as well. Why? Because we can simply use induction. Assume that j already is up to n, I show that if j already is up to n, then both these values and j plus n minus x divided by 2 are up to n as well. What is the reason behind that? Well, the point is that I know that j is up to n. I'm sure about that. I also know that x is up to n as well because we have n numbers. So x of them have these bits as 1. Also n minus x is up to n. So it's like we're adding two numbers which both of them are up to n. And then we divide them by 2. So the final answer is going to be up to n as well. Therefore, by doing this, we are sure that these values are going to be up to n. And j always remains up to n. And our update is also in O of 1 because we are going to go to only two states. 
So the point is that we have an O N K rates of DP and the transitions from each DP to B O of one. Therefore, we are sure that our DP are, is going to work in the desired time because N K is a small N K is up to two times 10 to the 6th. Therefore, it's gonna work.